Welcome back, my faithful friends. Appreciate you joining us today for our excursion into a brand new chapter of the book of Romans. We're we're in Romans chapter 9. In fact, I want you to consider Romans 9, 10, and 11 as a unit. It's really important that we understand this because Romans 9 is a passage that many people struggle with. It's brought confusion to Christian circles, and many would look at Romans chapter 9 as a key passage to prove that somehow God has chosen certain people to go to heaven and chosen certain people not to go to heaven. And I want to demonstrate that that is certainly not the case, Uh, not in my view. And we want to talk about terms like election. Uh, used to over 20 times in the Bible, but a word that that doesn't mean that God chose some people ahead of their own choice for salvation, uh, a much different term, and we're going to look at it. We're going to discover what this passage means in its context and to understand that God's heart in Romans 9, 10, 11 is really not a heart of exclusion. Like, I am going to exclude the majority of mankind from salvation. No, really, the heart of God in Romans 9, 10, and 11 is the exact opposite. It's that he wants to include. And the argument in these chapters is the fact that God has the prerogative to include the Gentiles, to bring in this mass of humanity into God's salvation plan. And it's a it's a marvelous section. I can't wait to get into all of it. Today, we're going to see the heart of the Apostle Paul. So Paul is writing this church, presumably from Corinth. He is poised and ready to go to Jerusalem, to attend the feast there, to deliver the offering that he's been collecting for the poor saints at Jerusalem, And of course, we know that Paul was arrested there. He spent two years in Caesarea. He was there under the ruling, uh, the the rulership of uh, Felix and then Festus. And he had opportunity to stand before those kings and to witness to them, as Jesus had predicted he would uh, back in Acts chapter 9. And then uh, even Agrippa II, he was able to witness to him. We know those passages. And then, of course, eventually he left Caesarea uh, there by the sea, Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea by the sea, to be distinguished from Caesarea Philippi. And he made his way all the way to Rome. It was about a one-year-long voyage, and we read all about that in the book of Acts. And now, um, so so now here in Romans, he's talking to this church and anticipating his visit to them. In Romans 15, he talks about that. So in Romans 9, I just want did you to get the picture. He's in a place where he has started a church and has had a great burden for the Jewish people there. And if you read Acts 18 carefully, you'll realize that the Apostle Paul had a negligible influence among the Jewish people in Corinth. As a matter of fact, he kind of got them mad. And it seemed like wherever Paul went, he went to the Jew first, as was his stated philosophy. But in many places, it was not the Jew that received the message of Paul. Now, now some did, but as far as the success, as we would count success in modern ministry, uh, Paul's success was among the Gentiles, and indeed, that was his call. He, he was sent to the Gentiles, not to the exclusion of Jews, but that was the specific uh, apostleship of the Apostle Paul given to him by the Lord. Now, why did I say all that? I said all that because if we're not careful, we'll look at Paul just, well, he went to Gentiles, and Peter, he went to Jews. And that is a little bit of a simplification because Paul went to everybody. And in many respects, his heart for and burden about the Jewish people superseded his burden for anybody else. I mean, after all, Paul was a Jew. He was raised as a Pharisee. He had great passion and zeal for the traditions of his fathers. He talked all about that in Galatians chapter 1. 
So here in Romans chapter 9, we see a little snippet of the kind of heart that Paul had for his people. And I think that the Holy Spirit has included this in Scripture so that you and I can kind of look at that and say, wow, you know, what kind of burden do I have for the souls of men? What kind of burden do I have for the people that I call brethren? So look at it, Romans chapter 9, verse number 1, where the Apostle Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That's a really, really careful way of saying what I'm about to say is the gospel truth. Like what I'm about to say is absolutely 100% true. So think about it. I say the truth, but not just the truth, the truth in Christ. Boy, that elevates it. Uh, I lie not. Hey, I say the truth. It's the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. And then this, uh, my conscience bears me witness. I mean, I, if I were lying, my, my, my conscience would be, would be accusing me. No, I'm telling you with a clear conscience, I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth in Christ and the Holy Ghost bears witness. So whatever the Apostle Paul is about to say, we can, we can know that this is of utmost importance to him. Now, what is it? Well, look at verse number two. That, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. So there's a sense in which the Apostle Paul, although I believe Paul was a joyful person, I don't think joy and sorrow are necessarily mutually exclusive. We know that the Apostle Paul valued joy very highly. He wrote the church at Philippi, and the whole letter was about we can be joyful in our trials. We can be joyful even amidst our sorrows. So here, though, we learn a little bit about the Apostle Paul's burden, that he carried a continual, never-ending burden in his heart for his people. There was a heaviness in his heart, a heaviness, a weight. Uh, there was a continuousness to the sorrow that he felt when he thought about his people, the Jewish people that did not understand the gospel. These to whom the word of God had been given, Romans chapter 3. These with whom he had grown up. These whose traditions he loved so deeply, yet they were blind. And they were rejecting the very Messiah himself. And this filled Paul with sorrow. Look at verse number 3. For, so what's the degree to which he was sorrowful? What's the degree to which his burden manifested itself? This is amazing. Uh, in fact, this may be one of the most amazing verses of testimony I've ever read. Verse number three, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. Now, obviously that's hypothetical. We can't lose our salvation, not even voluntarily. That's why Paul said, for I could, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. You know, it's it's almost like if I could go to hell and my people would be saved, I would do it. Wow, you talk about the heart of Christ because Christ literally did that. He suffered our hell for us upon the cross. So he actually did this. Paul said if, there's, if there, were a, there were a way that I could take the place of my nation, I would do it. I, I see in Paul here the heart of Moses, remember? As Moses interceded for the people there in the wilderness. And wow, I, I just look at verses like these and say, do I have even a snippet of that kind of burden for my people, uh, for my family, for uh, my Jerusalem for uh, the people, for my country. Do I? Well, Paul did. Watch what he says about his people in verse number four, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Israel, who has received so much, 
Israel, who has been so highly favored, Israel, who has been the recipient of all of these added blessings, and therefore will be held to a much higher level of accountability because she has known so much, she has seen so much, and yet she, with all of that, has rejected the very gospel that I preach and the very Messiah whom I serve. You know what that tells me? That tells me that religious attainment does not equal salvation. That tells me that proximity to Christ doesn't necessarily mean a relationship with Christ. Think about the people that were in greatest proximity to Jesus in his public ministry, the people of Israel. And yet they, as a group, as a nation, rejected him. Think specifically about the people that were closest to him, his own brothers. They grew up with him. You don't spend any more time growing up than with your brothers. And yet during his public ministry, his own brothers, John chapter 7, rejected him. His own hometown rejected him. Not once, Luke chapter 4, but twice they rejected him. Think of that. So proximity and familiarity don't necessarily equal relationship. And here, the Apostle Paul lists all the benefits, all the blessings, all the reasons why his people should have most readily received Christ. And that's why when Paul would go to a particular city, whether that be Thessalonica, that's a really good example, he would take out the scriptures And he would show the Jews, you see this? We know the Bible. These oracles were given to us and this responsibility was given to us. And let me show you what you're missing in your Bible. And he would try to show them the benefit of all the things he just listed to point to, to point to Christ, to point to Messiah, to point to Jesus being Messiah. And some were saved. Some saw it, but so many did not. And every rejection by a Jewish person added to the sorrow and the heaviness that Paul felt. Would you look at verse number five as he goes on to talk about his people? He said, whose are the fathers? You know, all the prophets were Jewish prophets. We talk about the, the fathers. All, all the patriarchs were Jewish fathers. Abraham, and then Isaac, Jacob, Judah, of course, Joseph, we can go right on down. Even Moses and Joshua. You can go through the, the, the kings, and Saul and David and Solomon, the divided kingdom. You can go through all of these examples. The fathers, they belong to us. This is our history. This is our ancestry.com. Whose are the fathers? And of whom, as pertaining to the flesh, Christ came. Jesus was a Jew. He came unto his own. Remember John emphasized that in John 1? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, like all of these Gentiles, to whom God turned and said, I include you. Remember, I said this a couple episodes ago. God uses exclusivity to highlight his inclusivity. So when God elected, we'll talk about this in in the ensuing episodes, when God elected Israel, chose her for special service, he wasn't electing her to salvation because not all Israel saved. So if election means salvation, then I guess you can lose your salvation, which obviously is not true. No, he elected her to special service, but she did not, she did not obey in that special service. She did not keep her end of the covenant. She was not a good testimony of the glory of God to the surrounding nations. So God was exclusive in his love for her so that in that exclusivity and that call and that election, he could reach out to the world. So the exclusivity of God for some and for the minority really is a highlight of the inclusivity of God for all people. Look at verse number five again. We're out of time. Whose are the fathers of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. And literally what that means is God the blessed, the blessed God forever. Jesus is God. Oh, if they could only see it. Here's the Messiah. He's a Jew. 
He came to you, God in the flesh, and you missed him. How sad that makes me. So that's Paul's testimony, his burden for his people. Uh, Next episode, we'll jump into uh, more of what you typically think about in Romans 9, election and uh, predestination and how does that all work out. Uh, I hope you don't go away. It's going to be an exciting few episodes. God bless you, my friends.